Thank you so much for joining us for the 2021 Concordia Annual Summit. My name is Matthew Swift and I am the co-founder and CEO of Concordia. The conversation you are about to see is something that we have hosted on a number of occasions in terms of the growing and evolving role of ESGs and how it guides financial, corporate, and increasingly geopolitical decision making. I've watched this space with immense interest, and it's my distinct pleasure to introduce a timely conversation between two individuals that I deeply respect. Stephen Fox is the founder of Veracity Worldwide, a strategic intelligence firm that focuses on ESG, political and reputational related risks. Founded in 2007, the firm has completed over 2,000 client projects. He was previously a U.S. diplomat in Africa and the Middle East, and his work has been profiled in Harvard Business School case studies and in the New Yorker magazine. Stephen will be joined by Jillian Tett, a Concordia Leadership Council member who recently published AnthroVision, A New Way to See in Business and Life, and is the editor-at-large at the Financial Times. This conversation, taking place at the 2021 Concordia Annual Summit, moves us in a direction that begins to answer some key questions. Number one, what are the risks investors and companies could face by being overly reliant on ESG scores and ratings? How can this be addressed? Number two, where is the intersection between ESG and geopolitics, and how can we expect these intertwined dynamics to play out? Number three, what information do investors and operating companies need to truly be ESG attentive? And for the last question, looking in the future, what other types of information will firms need to make a meaningful impact against ESG aims? This is going to be a continuing conversation for Concordia to host with continued expertise from the team at Veracity Worldwide and others as getting these questions right is truly essential for the times we're living in today. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the conversation. Great to, great to have you here. Thank you, pleasure Thank to you. be here with you. Thank you, now, um, am I due to say a few words on Absolutely. the book? Absolutely, well listen, I'm here basically to say a few words and to impart a message that I think that most people probably haven't heard before, which is that as we look to make sense of the world today, one area where we can look for ideas is cultural anthropology. Um, something which sounds very surprising to many people who've been trained in economics or finance or policy making, because many people think that anthropology is basically like the academic version of Indiana Jones. It's kind of dusty, dry, full of swashbuckling people who go off. But I was trained as a cultural anthropologist before I became a journalist, and I'm passionate about the idea that what anthropology gives you is lateral vision. It gives you an ability to try and see beyond all the tunnel vision tools that we've been using in recent years to try and often fail to make sense of the world, like economic models, like corporate balance sheets, like big data sets. And the reality is today, if you're relying on a narrow economic model to try and navigate the world, it's a bit like someone walking through a dark wood at night with a compass and only ever looking down at the dial. Your compass may be brilliant, you may be technologically clever, it may point you vaguely in the direction you want to go, but if you just look down at the dial all the time, you are going to walk into a tree. Um, we need to look up, look around, be aware of the context in which we've created all these economic models and balance sheets, and be aware of what's outside those models, like the environment, like issues like inequality. So lateral vision in a, fl in a world that's changing very rapidly is incredibly important. And that's something that cultural anthropology can absolutely inject by essentially teaching people that it pays to have a desire to go and explore the world and get to grips with someone else's point of view, even if it's different from your own, or especially if it's different from your own, having a sense of culture shock pays to have empathy for others, both to understand how the world works in an era when we're very globalized and exposed to each other, but then also because jumping out of your world to explore how others operate 
enables you to see yourself more clearly too. The Chinese have a great proverb, a fish can't see water. You have to jump out of your fishbowl to see yourself clearly. So jumping out of your fishbowl is something we all need to do today to explore other cultures and to get that sense of lateral vision about how the world's working. And that's something which is absolutely cr critical for ESG, for environmental, social, and governance issues today. No, I, I think that's absolutely unparalleled, and particularly when we think about all the attention that's paid to ESG scores and ratings that are out there. And while conventional ESG ratings are important, they create information gaps, and those in turn leave businesses exposed, as you've written about often in, in the FT. Some of those shortcomings of conventional ESG scores that are out there, an over-reliance on self-disclosures, a focus on policies rather than practices, inconsistencies in disclosure, differences across sectors and countries, a lack of local content. Wirecard, which you covered in the FT extensively, I think is uh, a very good example. In the case of Wirecard, that was a company that said all the right things in terms of ESG, and we certainly looked into this business. And as we looked, we said, taking a closer look, there were major governance flaws here. It was a multi-billion dollar fraud. In addition to Wirecard, we looked recently at a palm oil company. And the palm oil company, again, was at one level saying all the right things. But when you dug a layer deeper into it, you were able to see that the hidden issues sat with a subsidiary company. And that was where the dirty work was being done. Julian, you've reported on companies with shortfalls, countless firms who didn't know what they were doing uh, in terms of their, their counterparties, and they didn't have enough visibility into their own operations. But as we look ahead, I think there'll be more scrutiny coming from governments, from communities, from media, from shareholders. And all of those require, as you've described in the book, ESG attentiveness as a strategic imperative. And ESG-related decisions at the end of the day, we believe, depend on insights, researched, sourced, contextually relevant, like any other decision. What we describe as bespoke insights or ESG intelligence. And that's, I think, what I found so inspiring when I was reading your book, was how you take a lens around those and say, how do you really drill down and, and understand from multiple perspectives? I guess what I'm really trying to say is, you know, I am pleading for a sense of context for a sense of consequence and for checks and balances. And we live in a world that's drowning in AI. And I'm not sitting there saying that artificial intelligence you know, is useless. On the contrary, it can do amazing things and we should all celebrate it. But a world of AI needs a second AI, anthropology intelligence, to just have that human sense of co checks and balances, that sense of common sense. Um, but if we step back for a minute, I mean, the big picture is what we should all celebrate is that we are at least groping for new data sets, new ways to look at the world, um, a sense of lateral vision. We're all recognizing that the way we looked at balance sheets in the past in terms of what companies were doing is no longer good enough. We need a wider sense of all the impacts, um, all the things that can influence a company. So to that, Julian, I would add also that as we're in a turbocharged age in terms of geopolitics. I think geopolitics becomes another lever or lens which has particular resonance in the ESG world. Uh, I think of it as an essential yet often neglected prism for ESG issues, issues that are unique to a given jurisdiction. A company might ask, can we make a particular pronouncement work in one place? Or the opposite, we're active in one market, what do we need to know about that particular market? So at the end of the day, and I think as you point out in the book, local context and geopolitical context are absolutely critical. ESG also can wind up being a geopolitical lever. The European Union, for example, has put in environmental requirements that, while important from an ESG perspective, also are favorable to European businesses, whereas the US and Australia on human rights issues have used those to an extent as a cudgel over China and Chinese companies. So ESG becomes part of a broader geopolitical discussion. And at the end of the day, these are not new issues, but they certainly are taking on new prominence. Well, I can tell you for a lot of time that people who found out that I was working as a financial journalist with the Financial Times would assume that I had a background in finance or an MBA or economics or astrophysics because 
for so many years, people who worked in policy making, particularly in economics and finance, worshipped the quantitative sciences. Um, and you know that's wonderful. Numbers matter. If we can't count things, it's very hard to measure them. You know, if you got sorry, quite quote my roommate. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, but I think the last decade has really seen us recognise that if you're going to have effective policy making tools today, you need to blend computer science, data science with social science, economic science with social science, medical science with social science. I mean. Just think about what's happened in the, in the last 18 months with COVID. You know, one thing we've learned is you cannot beat a pandemic just with medical science or data science because no matter how brilliant your medicine is or your vaccines, no matter how good your computer system for tracking where the, vac the pandemic is moving, if you can't change behavior and understand behavior in relation to things like lockdowns or vaccine hesitancy, you're not going to actually make a difference. Um, and that same pattern is true of so many areas of life. And equally, we need to look at those three different elements or four different elements, social science, behavior, um, computer science, economic science, medical science, to understand the world. You know what I think, Julian, that's a great segue into a phrase that we've become comfortable with, which is ESG attentive, meaning are you really switched on on ESG issues? So if we think about every rationale for ESG attentiveness, the level of commitment. So sometimes you have a company that's at what we would describe as the bare minimum compliance level. Maybe they move up the spectrum and they're interested in making public relations statements or they're part of value investing or they're truly interested in meaningful stakeholder engagement or really at the forefront are there companies that are driving political and behavior change to support a broader ESG agenda. So just to drill down into those a little bit, we'd say all of them require what we describe as ESG intelligence or the sort of anthro vision that you discuss in your book. If you're involved in basic compliance, I think there's a danger of being flat-footed in a shifting regulatory environment. If you're trying to build a public profile as ESG attentive, but your own house is not in order, then you could be tarred with greenwashing. ESG attentiveness as a key to value investing, a green stamp that's on your investments has to be legitimate or it will be seen as illegitimate. There really needs to be an underpinning. And then most importantly, if you're trying to bring about real change, it's a combination of all of these, of grasping the stakeholder environment and trying to understand, do you have the right bandwidth for change and do you engage in an informed way? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I'd put it slightly differently. I'd say that um, when the EST movement started, or CSR as it used to be called, it was driven by activists who actively wanted to change the world. And, you know, I salute that completely. Um, you know, many people involved in the movements today are still driven by that desire. I think the big shift that has enabled the EST movement to explode in business and finance in the last few years is a growing number of people who don't so much hope to change the world as to simply do no harm to the world or more cynically to do no harm to themselves. I think for many companies today and financiers, ESG is actually a tool of risk management, be that protecting against reputational risk, regulatory risks, the loss of employees, um, customers, investors, etc. And you can sit there and be like a cynical journalist and say, well, doesn't that make the whole movement totally hypocritical? All these company leaders and financiers saying they like ESG are just simply greenwashing or pretending to. Or you can say, um, speaking as someone who started my career as a journalist covering real life revolutions on the street, revolutions happen not when a tiny minority of committed activists start shouting, but when the silent majority decide it's more dangerous or risky for them to block it. And essentially, we've been at a tipping point in the last few years in that company leaders and financiers and policymakers realize that if they don't go along with this new zeitgeist shift, they are going to end up losing out. So in some ways, that is a type of victory for the original activists. Either way, it shows that the zeitgeist is changing and to navigate it, you need this lateral vision. No, I think that's a good segue just into thinking in the next couple of minutes about looking towards the future and that idea of just simply screening for ESG investments won't really move the needle. The question is, how do you push forward? How do you become serious about ESG attentiveness? And how to be successful? 
if you're a company, probably understanding your stakeholder environment and mapping it carefully, being aware of what's happening in each of the jurisdictions in which you're working, and being attentive to practices, not just making pronouncements. All of those underpinned by exactly as you described in the book, having good ESG intelligence across the way. Well, that's a hope, and the question is how you get it. And I'd say at the end of the day, checks and balances, a sense of context, a sense of consequence. I mean, one way to define what the big shift is now today, the zeitgeist shift, is we're moving into an era of consequence-based capitalism, where it's no longer enough just to try and make money, build a business. You need to be aware of your footprint on the wider world. And once again, the problem is that most people trained through business schools um, until very recently have not been trained to think like that. And do you think that's shifting as we go I forward? Think, I think it's absolutely shifting. And um, do you see that shifting? I mean, in terms of your perception of where things are going? It's interesting. We've done lots of work in the mining sector where I actually think in terms of ESG issues, while mining companies get lambasted on the E side, they're actually very attentive on the S and on social issues and community engagement, whereas people operating in the renewable space have great environmental attentiveness, but often wind up not paying any attention on the S side. Yeah, I mean, one of the problems of the ESG is how do you square off those three, um, three letters? But how would you see the world looking in five years' time? I think that the ESG agenda is here to, to stay, and it's not just a fad of the moment. And in fact, the scorings and rankings will become more established as time goes on. But more importantly, there will be an inherent cultural change, not only in leadership, but throughout the organizations, and in understanding from that multi-stakeholder perspective. And I think that's the biggest shift that we're seeing. Europe has been ahead of the US, but I think the US is catching up rapidly. Yeah, well, we're certainly seeing that in terms of, you know, interest in the Financial Times. Um, you know, a few years ago, we created a platform called Moral Money, which looks at ESG, and that has really seen exploding interest. So I think we're barely at the beginning of it. But Absolutely. So unfortunately, our time is wrapping up, but a pleasure to talk with you. And to anyone who hasn't had a chance to read Jillian's book, I would recommend yeah, it highly. This is the one. Anyway, well, very thank nice you very much indeed. Thank you.